Hi everybody and welcome back to Digital VLSI Design. Today we'll do Lecture 9, Routing. So what's the problem with routing? The scale is huge. So here we can see that we have thousands of macro blocks, we probably have millions of gates inside, millions of wires, and what happens is when we start connecting them we get literally kilometers of wires even though this chip may be only a few millimeters on a few millimeters and we must connect all of these millions of wires. The geometric complexity of this problem is huge. For a basic starting point we'll see that we'll take a grid representation we'll decide that um, our chip is divided into these very fine nice grids but um, at nanoscale, the geometry rules are very complex. We have to take these all into account and we have to route according to these rules. There are different routing layers as well and the different routing layers have different costs. So we may want to route uh, at a certain layer with certain rules at another layer with other rules. We may have um, some sort of advantage to route in one layer than another. The electrical complexity is also hard. It's not just enough to connect the wires. We also have to ensure that the delays through the wires are small to ensure that the crosstalk between the wires, the wire to wire interactions don't mess up the behavior. Um, we have to make this a, a good solution, not just a sufficient solution. So let's define our problem. The problem is that given a placement and a fixed number of metal layers, we want to find a valid pattern of horizontal and vertical wires that connect the terminals of the nets. The input to our problem is the cell locations, which came out of placement and uh, some clock tree synthesis. And we have a net list of all the cells and how they connect to each other. We don't have the nets themselves. Okay, what we have to do is we have to give a geometric layout of each net that connects the various standard cells together, uh, actually each pin of each standard cell to each other. Um, we do this as most of our algorithms do in a two-step process. We start with something we call global routing, then we'll go into detail routing. We'll get to that later, but they use the same type of principles to, to work. And our objective is, first of all, what we have to have. We have to have 100% connectivity of a system. Um, we need to get to a point where our system, every single net in our net list is connected to its relevant pins. And um, we want to do this with minimum area and minimum wire length. The constraints... Well, we have a certain fixed number of routing layers and they have different um, types of uh, design rules. Um, all the design rules, different width, spacing, and so forth. We want to meet our timing constraints. We have our SDC and we want to uh, meet our timing, uh, our, set, our max delay and our uh, min delay. Um, we don't want to have crosstalk problems after finishing the routing and we want to deal with process variations as well. That's uh, pretty tough. So let's start by discussing um, some basic routing algorithms. And again, this is based on Rob Rutenbar's wonderful course. And uh, if you want to know a bit more about it, I would go turn to Rob Rutenbar's course and, and his, um, his lecture slides. So let's start with the grid assumption. So despite the complexity of nano and nanoscale routing, we're going to use a grid assumption and uh, the complexity will come in later. Some of it we won't touch on in this course. So we're going to assume that the whole grid, our whole chip, is a, uh, is a grid of regular squares. Okay, a legal wire, what it does, it takes a source, some sort of a gate where, let's say, a, the pin of a driver, and we have a target, the uh, pin of the sink, and we want to connect somehow the source to the sink. A legal wire has a, a, a continuous connection. Okay, so we have to have some sort of a short circuit between the source and the sink um, location. They, there may be obstacles in here, and obstacles are places that we cannot route through. Um, for example, an obstacle may be if we already used that grid cell, we can't use it again, or else we'll have a short circuit between two nets. Okay, um, we're going to use what we call Manhattan routing. Manhattan, as you know, has uh, vertical streets and horizontal streets and um, our vertical avenues and horizontal streets and this is uh, and we're going to always connect our um, nets in only vertical and horizontal routes and so we call that manhattan routing that will help us um, eliminate all kinds of problems that would uh, would be to just give any any um, given direction and shape okay so uh, we're gonna give names to this so up and down that's going to be called a northern and southern route and east and west are going to be um, right and left route. So with this basic grid assumption, we can come and develop what's called a maze router or a Lee router. Um, this is an algorithm uh, class that started in 1961 with a, a breakthrough paper by C.Y. Lee. 
Okay, so the strategy is to route one net at a time. So we're going to take all our million routes, we're going to select one of them and route it. For this certain net, we're going to find the best wiring path that it can have. Um, best will be the shortest, basically. Um, there is a problem here, though. Um, routing one net at a time means that we're going to have some sort of a heuristic that's going to choose which net we we go for first, and we're going to run into into big problems where an early wired net may block a, a later net. So, for example, in this case here, we have these two blue nets which were routed first, and then we have this red net which cannot find a path to be routed through. Um, so, if we would have cho chosen a different uh, uh, a, a different uh, um, order of routing, we wouldn't have had these blocks and we would have been able to route this uh, system. Okay, for example, if we would have taken the blue net and uh, we would have routed it over here, and this one we would have routed through there, then we could have routed this over here and they wouldn't have blocked each other. But because we chose to route these two first, we actually blocked the red one and we won't find a solution. But the sure thing is that um, uh, we won't be able to find an optimal route for each net because previous routes will block them. Okay, so this is a, a, a important heuristic. Um, the basic idea for this maze routing is again a three-step type of an algorithm. We do expand, then backtrace, and then clean up, and we'll go over these steps now. So the first step again is expand. So we have our grid here, we have our source in this box over here, and we have our target in this box over here, and we want to find the shortest possible path to get from the source to the target net with our assumptions, such as we can only put one net in each uh, grid block, it, co it costs us one, uh, one step to go from one grid block to another, and we have to use Manhattan routing so we can go horizontal and vertical. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to start at the source, and we're going to give it the cost to route there. And in this case, we're starting with one. So it costs one um, routing step, routing unit, to um, put a, a, a wire there at the source. Then we're going to look for all the paths that are exactly one step away from it, and we can see that we get um, these. Uh, we can get to each one of these boxes within two steps. So one at the source, and then one at this net. Uh, one at the source, or one at this uh, grid box. And we're going to continue until we reach the target. So all those boxes take three steps to get to. All of these take four. Again, we can get to this guy by going one, two, three, four, and we reach that. Okay? Um, we can reach this guy, one, two, three, four, and so they have an equivalent kind of a weight. And we continue doing that until we eventually hit our target. And now we got to our target, and we can see that we can get to our target in six steps. Okay? Um, so that's what we call expansion. If we look at this, we have this type of a wavefront. All of these uh, boxes, they take all these grid uh, spaces, they take exactly the same number of uh, routes to get to. So we can get to this guy within five steps, and this guy within five steps, or this guy within five steps, or this guy within five steps. And that looks kind of like how a wave goes, or if you took a rock and you threw it into a pond and how the... Um, uh, how the uh, wave goes and expands from where the rock hit. Okay, so we found that we can reach the target within six steps. Now what we're going to do is we're going to do what's called backtrace and cleanup. So how do we know which uh, actual um, uh, routing path to take? So we do what's called backtrace. We're going to follow the path length backwards in descending order. So we start with this box that's numbered 6 over here, and we're going to look for one that's 5. We look, we found this one, so we mark it, and look for one that's 4, and 3, and 2, and 1. We could have done other things. We could have gone 6 to 5, to 4, to 3, to 2, to 1. We could have gone 6 to 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. We could have gone 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. All of those were legal shortest routes. Okay, so um, this uh, will mark the shortest path to the target. However, there may, may be many shortest paths, so optimization can be used to select the best one because we don't know which is the best of the shortest path. That will only know according to the in complete solution of our problem, which is very, very hard to, to do because we have so many options um, with, with, a, with a large design. Okay, but we selected one of them with some sort of heuristic, and now we have to do cleanup which says, okay, we've routed the net, what do we do? We can't route anything else inside um, these boxes because our assumption right now was we could only put one net in each uh, of these grid boxes. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna mark the whole thing, the whole net that we just routed, as an obstacle for the rest of the algorithm. So um, this black stuff means our next net cannot route through this blockage.
So how do we deal with blockages? So now we've marked our first net that, um, that routed through here. And if we route something else through there, we're going to cause a short between two nets. So what do we do? This is our second source. This is our second target. And now we're just going to see that our um, algorithm will just go around these blockages. We mark it with a uh, one at our source, just like before. We look and we see that we can get to these three boxes within two steps. And then we continue our expansion. And what we see is that amazingly, our algorithm will just go around the blockage. Okay, so we reached our target and we did backtrace. And we see that we were able to route our second target within six grid steps by just going around the blockage. Again, this is not the shortest possible net there is because, for example, we could have gone one, two, three, four, but that would have gone through the blockage. And since we chose to route this one first, we've lost the ability to route it like that. But our shortest net within uh, at this point of time is to route it that way. Okay, so to summarize our, our the initial points of maze routing, we're going to start with expand. Expand is a breadth for its search, a BFS, that finds all the paths from the source to the target in path length order. Then we're going to backtrace, which means we're going to walk our shortest path back from the target to the source. And finally, we're going to clean up, which means we're going to mark our net as an obstacle and erase all these distance markers. These guys are irrelevant for the next step. So that's our expand, backtrace, cleanup basic of maze routing. Are we finished? Of course not. So um, as we know, we have a lot of these types of fan outs, right? So we have some sort of a gate that's driving several gates. And up till now, we just uh, discussed a point to point net. So this would be the source and here we'd have a bunch of targets. So let's just take a, a two point net, uh, two target um, a, a fan out of two. And so we have this source over here and we have two targets that makes a three point net. How do we deal with this type of a thing? Okay, so it's pretty straightforward and our, our algorithm that we brought up till now deals with it very well. So we start with our regular maze routing algorithm to find the path to the nearest target. How do we do that? We put the one on our source and we start our wave propagation. Okay, and we go forward until we hit the target and then we backtrace and we're going to clean up. So we found that it took four steps to get to our first target. Okay, now what do we do? Well, remember that we're talking about an electrical wire. All of the points on this net that we routed now are going to be equipotential. So it doesn't matter if our second um, wire, it starts from here or it starts from there. They all are equipotential. All of the, 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 the electricity is at all of these places at the same time. The voltage is um, equivalent. Okay, so that means we can just mark all of these guys as new sources. Okay, so we'll mark all of our initial um, route as sources. Then we'll clean that up. Okay, that's already um, routed. That's part of our final net. And now we'll start again. So. If they're all sources, we mark them all as ones. And now we can do our wave expansion um, from those guys all as ones to twos, to threes, to fours, and finally reach our target within five steps and do our backtrace and cleanup. And what we found is we can have this net that looks like this. And, um, and from this source, it took a lot more to get there, but we don't care about that source once we um, routed the first part. Okay, this does not guarantee the shortest path. That's uh, the shortest path there. Algorithms for solving that. That's called a Steiner tree, but it gives a very good solution. Okay, our next problem is how do we deal with routing several layers? So we already discussed that we're not um, doing this type of a thing where we have just one layer with things uh, routing for each other. So we're gonna use the same basic idea. We're gonna make one grid for each layer of routing, okay? And not only that, we're gonna say that each grid box can contain a via or a contact that goes between one um, grid layer and the next one. This gives us a new expansion layer. If up till now we were doing north and, th north and, th north and south and east and west, now we're gonna have an up and down direction. Okay, so here we have two uh, grid layers, metal one and metal two. 
we have a source that happens to be in this case on metal one and a target on metal two. Notice that a lot of these examples I'm making, they're kind of um, wrong for our basic planar VLSI type of uh, processes because our source and our target would, would always be on the bottom planar transistor front end layer. But um, just for the play uh, example here, we just put the source on one layer and the target on the other. Another thing that we're going to play around with is we're going to say, aha, we can't have a via anywhere because it would be too hard to show our example, even though in, a, in, in, a, in essence we could have a via in any one of these boxes. We're going to say we have a, a, the option to put a via here and an option to put a via here. Um, so when we look at metal one, this is in one, two, three, one, two, three, right? Three to three. So this is also a three, three because this via goes up to here and this one is over here at six, two. So 6.2 has a via. So this via will bring us up over to here. But actually, our um, real algorithm could go and cross the two layers at any point that's not already taken. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to start by marking our source as 1 and continue our wave expansion. And you see that within four steps, we hit a via. Okay, that means that we can now expand upwards. So our next step gives us the option to get to this point within five steps. So we can go one, two, three, four, five. Okay, we will continue our expansion on our regular layer two. So our wave continues to expand over here, but now it also starts to expand on the second layer. So we continue over there, we get six, seven, eight, and look at that, we reached our second target. That was before we went up our second via because to get to this um, place, it would have taken us nine uh, steps. So we've reached our target within eight steps, and now we can backtrace um, through the via and find our, our complete net. So that was multi-layer routing, but that's not all. I mean, actually, there's a lot more stuff, but one of the uh, things we want to discuss is that vias, we've already mentioned, have relatively high resistance, and we should prefer to stay on the same layer and not keep on going up and down between layers. Another thing is we said that we want to use Manhattan routing where we have each layer only being routed in one direction and then um, that helps us not have not block tracks and not have shorts and so forth. So we'll have a, a certain layer only going horizontally and another layer only, I mean and that one was vertically and another layer only going horizontally and we can move between them using vias but if we want to get from this place to, to this place what we'll do is we'll use this layer going to, uh, to the right and then go up in a via and this layer going up. How do we make sure that the tool does that and doesn't just do that in one layer where it will block off additional horizontal layers this way? Okay, so um, how are we going to do that? What we're going to do is that, uh, to penalize um, any type of a turn that we take or any type of a jog when we're going the wrong way on the same layer. So um, we're going to find a way um, to actually come and prefer to route in a certain layer and direction and this we're going to do with what we call non-uniform grid costs okay so let's go back to uh, uh, our example that has two metal layers and in this case we define that metal layer one should be horizontally um, routed and metal layer two should be vertically routed in addition we have our source over here and our target over here they are on the same layer this time and we have our vias, which we've only put in two spaces here and here and here and here on the second layer. Okay, but this time what we're going to do is we're going to say, listen, these vias, we don't want to use them that much. So we're going to give them a cost of 10 versus a cost of one just for a regular type of route. Another thing is we're going to say that if on metal layer one, we can horizontally route with a cost of one and on metal two, we can vertically route on the cost of two. Well, if we take the wrong way route, for example, if we go up and down or I mean north and south on metal one, our cost of our route will be 10. And if we go east and west on metal two, the cost of our route will be 10. And let's see what this does. So we start with our source costing one and we know that we can go um, again horizontally. We can go to the east at the cost of one, but the second we want to go north and south, it's going to cost us 10. So to get to these two adjacent boxes, it's going to cost us two to get to the box that's east of our uh, source. But to get to the box that's north of our source, it's already going to cost us 11. Okay, and we can continue on this way. We'll always look for the lowest cost grid box that we have currently. So our lowest cost grid box is two. 
So we're going to expand 2 to the right and uh, up, and we'll see that uh, we get 3 and 12, and we, we get to a via over here. And going through the via, we also know that it's going to cost us 10, so up to here it's going to cost us 13. Our lowest cost right now in our whole grid is the 4 over here. So there's no reason to expand 13 until we've finished expanding 4. So we continue over here going 4, 5, 6. And 6 is still our lowest cost, so again, but it can only go up and down, or north and south, which will cost us 16. And we've actually gotten to the point where 13 now is our lowest costing um, box in the whole thing. So um, now we're going to assume that we used this via, and we're at 13 over here. And remember that now going north and south will cost us 1, while going east and west will cost us 10. So going south we get 14. And going west, we get 23, and we continue like that. And now this via, which is the uh, uh, is it's, it costs 15. This guy also costs 15. So those were the lowest costing um, boxes in our grid. So we uh, also continued going this way there. And um, what else? We went with our 15 down, and we got to 25 over here. Okay, um, but. Still, 15 is our lowest costing box, so we continue to 16, 17, and, um, and now, uh, actually, our lowest costing box over here is the, the, the 16 over here, and um, what we see is that our next step will actually bring us within the cost of 1 to our target which will be um, 26. So we see that we were able to use our non-uniform grid cost to go through uh, different layers. We uh, clean that up. And what we see is that we only routed horizontally on metal one and we only routed vertically on metal two. We chose to use two vias on the way. Um, this is, of course, a strong function of the cost that we gave to vias and non uh, and non uniform and uh, wrong direction routing. So this is a type of heuristic that we need to again um, set our costs in a smart way. So how do we implement all of this um, in software? Well, grids are huge. Let's say we have a one by one centimeter chip. That's a very very big chip, but let's say that's the size of our chip. Let's say we have a 100 nanometer routing track, which is uh, a good assumption for, uh, for a nanoscale process. It's probably even um, uh, quite smaller than that. And let's say we have 10 routing layers, and for right now we'll just say that they're um, uh, equivalent routing layers. But if we start uh, multiplying each of those, we get 100 billion grid cells. Well, 100 billion is a really big number, and how are we going to actually deal with all of that um, trying to route and keep all that data in our in our memory. So we need a low cost representation for all this. So there are different ways to do that. We can only store the uh, wave front. We can remember which cells have been reached, which what cost and from which direction instead of remembering the entire grid. And we can use Dijkstra's algorithm to find the cheapest cell first. We also store the data in the heap to uh, be able to easily choose the uh, shortest route. But doing this is very hard, especially with the, um, the, the mini heuristics that I mentioned along the way and with the amount of data that we have here with so many um, routes that we need to do. So we'll use different heuristics. We'll have to use heuristics that will help us choose which net to route first. Um, try to do that in a way that will help us and get to a better optimal um, solution. We want to bias towards the right direction so we don't start looking a lot in the wrong direction, wasting uh, time, memory, and so forth. And um, then we have problems. We have all kinds of nanoscale problems of, uh, of uh, crazy design rules. How do we go about fixing them? We have to make all kinds of heuristics about that. And we have many more uh, problems. So making a router is a real tough thing. And routers tend to run for many hours in order to route um, blocks of chips. Well, how are we going to do this in practice then? Of course, what we're going to do is try to make our uh, problem much smaller. And that we do by dividing and conquering or using a global step before our detailed step. And this is called global routing. So what we're going to do with a big chip, we're going to make our chip or block. We're going to make our problem smaller by dividing the, the block into big coarse regions. For example, we'll take 200 by 200 tracks for each box and call it a G box or global box. Okay, and now we'll maze route the global boxes instead of maze routing um, a, the detailed box. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our chip, we're going to divide it into a more 
coarse grid. And then for each of these cells, we're going to say we have this and this and this and amount of sources, but not exactly say where they are inside the cell, just say they, that this is one box. And we'll get, we're going to get to some sort of a route that goes from each source to each target. Of course, we're going to be able to have several um, sources inside sources and targets and routes inside each box and we can actually have some sort of representation that will say how many um, uh, uh, routes are left through that box instead of just blocking them off each time we mark one net so um, we'll get, uh, by doing that we're going to also take care of congestion so congestion is the number of routes that are actually going through each edge of a box and so if we take a global route that goes like this um, for that net, it's going to take, you know, one net this way, one net this way, one net that way, one net that way. And if we had a total of 200 nets, then we only have 199 left. And we can have some sort of a, a dynamic type of a, a representation that um, will tell us the dynamic cost, which will tell us um, how many, uh, how much congestion we have there. And if we should use that box, or maybe we should give it a larger cost and use another box for the next net we want to route. So, um, after we did that, then we can look at our specific net here. We kind of do some sort of assignment that says, aha, now we have our source that was over here. We have to, um, uh, we have our target is over here instead of over here. And now we just have to do this route. Then we have this box, it has our source over here and our target over here, so it just has to do this route. This one has its source over here and its target over here, and it created this route, and once we connect all of them together, we'll get our fully connected um, long route that goes from the actual source to the actual target, but um, we did it in smaller parts where our smaller boxes were much easier to deal with in a complexity level. So those were the basic routing algorithms we used. And now we'll go over to how routing actually happens inside the EDA tools. So remember that metal stacks are changing and growing. What we see is some sort of a representative layer stacks for 130 nanometer to 32 nanometer technology nodes. And what I just want to point out here is that you can see that in older um, older technologies, what we have is just a bunch of metal layers which went and grew from uh, one or two metal layers into six or eight. Um, but they're the same type of thing. The, the height of the metal layers are the same and, and the distance between them and so forth. And therefore the DRC rules, the minimum spacing, minimum width was the same. But um, as we continued to progress, we wanted higher metal layers uh, to be thicker to reduce the RC and provide better um, power routing and maybe clock routing. And then as we progress, we have what we call X, Y, and Z layers. So they're different thicknesses. And you see that the lower uh, metal layers for local um, interconnect, the median layers for maybe clocking or longer global routes, and the top layers for mainly power connections. And it gets more and more complex as we go, and there are more and more routing layers. And you see that the top layers are really huge, and they're just used for power routing and for um, maybe the lower, a bit lower than that for the main clocks and so forth. Okay, so here we can actually see some photos of this. So here's a UMC six layer stack, and this is pretty, uh, um, pretty equivalent for the different layers. Maybe you have some thicker layers up top, but when you get to the Intel 45 nan uh, nanometer stack, you see that there's really a difference between the local interconnect lower layers and the global interconnect and then the power routing on top. Okay, so we need to take care of this within our routing algorithms. And as I said before, this becomes more and more complex as, as we go on and the tools become um, really heavy. Okay, so we start with uh, global routing inside our tools and we have to first say what our tracks are, what our, what our grid spaces are. And a track is basically um, the minimum spacing between two uh two metal layers so we see here minimum spacing between two metal layers and we have the minimum width of the metal layers so what you usually do is we say that we want to put down a metal that uh, it sits at the center of the metal layer sits on uh, on this virtual like track this uh, point that we call a track and we want to make sure that we can put a, a another metal layer with a minimum width on the, uh, the the adjacent layer and we won't have a DRC violation so the size of the um, uh, of the track is a, uh, a metal sp a metal width plus a metal uh, spacing that causes the pitch between our tracks and we basically um, lay out this track along our whole chip and these are these uh, points in in this case 
on uh, the x-axis giving us these vertical tracks that we can actually lay down wires okay so what we're going to do with global uh, global routers we're going to take a certain number of tracks let's say 10 tracks per layer now the tracks again can be different for different metal layers because our um, our drc rules are different so we may have our tracks defined like this in middle one but in middle five they may be different and we're going to take about 10 tracks per each layer and say that's going to be our g cell or our g box and we're going to uh, show here that we make this more coarse um, designed for our um, for our global grid and we're going to say we can now um, route the number of tracks we have that's the number of routes we can do through each edge um, and then we can do our maze routing to do our global route so uh, that that enables us to do fast grid routing fast maze routing through these uh, global cells or global boxes and um, when, when we do that we're going to take in optimizations that are obviously going to minimize wire length which we've discussed in our algorithms before we're going to also try to balance congestion by trying not to have too many tracks go through each edge and try to balance that out we're going to try to have it timing driven so we can uh, estimate parasitics and see that our our, our timing critical wires get um, better uh, shorter wires and we're going to have to also sometimes look at noise in SI which we'll discuss in a few minutes and maybe try to keep buses together okay so um, this is done as the first stage of our routing when we actually tell the tool to route our design but it's also used for trial route which is done earlier in the in the flow for example um, during placement we're going to run some trial routes to get better parasitic extraction and so forth so this is really quick maybe we won't do all these optimizations inside but we're going to want a real quick route and so we're going to use this type of a global route and say that's enough we're not going to fix any uh, types of, uh, of DRCs but we want to get a picture of the congestion so usually at the end of this type of a stage of a, of a global route we're going to be able to show our congestion map we can usually get some sort of a heat map that shows the areas that we have higher congestion and again during floor planning placement iterations we're going to look into that and try to fix those areas um, we can look at different types of congestion reports or uh, in the way it's shown in Inovis, we can take a certain type of an edge here and it's going to say um, what the congestion is in the vertical and in the horizontal directions and if we have these large congestion areas we better not continue uh, to our detailed route but go back and fix our floor plan um, and replace the design and so forth to try and get um, lower congestion or else we're not going to be able to route. So once we finished our global routing we can start detailed routing. What we're going to do is we're going to take each of our G boxes or our G cells and we're going to do track assignment saying each net that's inside where it connects to the next uh, G box we're going to give it a certain track that it has to uh, uh, meet and then we'll set the, that will set the source and target for each of these nets and then we can go and do this detailed route which is a more fine-tuned grid routing that actually takes each and every single one of these uh, layers and connects it from the source to the target in a detailed way inside the grid box inside the G box but uh, it's um, a much easier problem than routing the whole design so we're gonna assign nets to tracks lay down the wires connect the pins to the nets um, of course solve the DRC violations because in this track assignment we may be doing some sort of a rough type of a routing that uh, has all kinds of problems left and then really detailed route has to go iterate and try to solve all the, the detailed and complex DRCs um, we also have to check if we have cross uh, cross cap uh, cross coupling violations um, uh, crosstalk violations and uh, apply all kinds of special routing rules that we may have to defined so uh, the flow is track assignment and a type of a uh, uh, global routing inside the cell uh, um, I mean DRC fixing inside a global routing cell and continue in iterations trying to fix that and you'll see that the tools they um, tell you what type of a routing iteration it's going through on each of these cells okay what kind of DRC fixes are gonna is it gonna apply well we may have two um, tracks uh, two nets that were laid down exactly on the same track they're gonna be shorted together so it's gonna have to uh, put some spacing between them so they're not shorted anymore we may have all kinds of notches that appear so this is one case and this is another type of a case of a notch and DRC rules will tell us we're not allowed to have that type of a thing but 
they may be left over as a residue from our iterations and uh, the tool may see that look instead of doing this type of an elbow over here it could have just um, connected that directly and we wouldn't have this notch up here or in this case we had some sort of a uh, connection that went up to a via down and we could have just had some small piece of a wrong way route some sort of jog that would have solved that drc violation and made life easier um, we may have thin and fat spacing rules. So our tracks are based on minimum spacing rules, but then uh, with complex routing rules, one of the things that happens is if you have a thick wire, you can't put it uh, at a minimum spacing uh, next to a thin wire, or if wires run too long uh, beside each other. So these types of DRCs are gonna be seen after doing our uh, track assignment and our first iteration of a detailed route. And so we'll have to go and put some extra spacing between them. And finally, um, we may have uh, all kinds of things like when we take overlaps over our different via layers, we may have spacing um, violations that appear between the, uh, the contacts or so forth. And one way to do that is just to uh, offset them from each other so we don't get that minimum spacing violation. So these are just small examples of the types of DRC fixes that can be done in different iterations. Um, timing driven routing what does that mean well we're going to try to go and optimize the critical paths so we know from our uh, timing from our static timing analysis which paths are more critical and so we may decide to route those nets first to get them better straighter routes with less rcs um, uh, and get a shortest path possible not have all these problems of uh, being blocked by other nets we may um, actually go in manually assign net weights so we can go and say okay this net is more important than the other and the tool will go and uh, and route it first for example we may give a clock a higher net weight than other um, routes um, then we can go and uh, do apply uh, fixes such as wire widening if we widen the wire we're going to reduce its resistance and uh, possibly the rc delay through that wire will be lower um, and uh, finally, if, if we have a congestion design, we may need to set the timing driven effort to low or we may not be able to finish routing at all. And uh, in general, there's a lots and lots and lots of options inside the router. And just beware when you change the default options because you may make things happen that take your runtime um, to infinity and maybe you will finish with a lot of DRCs and not be able to route your design because of it. An important issue that we've kind of discussed in previous lectures, but we'll have to look into it again now, is signal integrity or SI. When we talk about routing, um, signal integrity is crosstalk. Um, that's true for clocks as we discussed in last lecture, but it's uh, uh, extra true here. So um, what it means is that a switching signal may be affected uh, by a neighbor, uh, may affect a neighboring net and cause some sort of a glitch on it or so forth. Um, we call the switching net an aggressor and we call the affected net a victim. So that's our nomenclature for that. And there are two major effects. The first one is signal slowdown, and that happens when the nets are switching in opposite uh, directions. So this signal is rising. At the same time, this signal is falling. And what happens is because this rows and there is crosstalk between these guys, um, what happened is this guy started to fall, but then it got the glitch that moved it up. And in total, the delay, the TPHL of this guy got longer. So that's a slowdown effect. The same thing can happen as a, with a speed up effect. So if this guy is falling and this guy is falling at the same time, it started to fall, but then this uh, aggressor pushed the crosstalk through to the victim and it caused um, a voltage jump that made a speed up on the net. So we got a shorter TPHL. Um, both of these effects are bad for us because in signal slowdown, we're going to hurt our setup, uh, our max delays. And in signal speed up, we're going to hurt our hold or our min delays. So we have to take both into account and check them and make sure that these um, capacitances aren't too big. So our uh, bumps or our glitches that happen because of crosstalk will be um, too large and cause timing violations that we didn't expect from our standard static timing analysis. So what happens when there are multiple aggressors? Um, what happens is we can have a, a, a I mean, we can't 
maybe have. This is the, the truth in every single signal that we have. We have different timing paths, and the different timing paths have cross cup, uh, cross uh, coupling capacitance that is connected to some sort of a victim net. So when we're looking at a tying path that goes through the victim net, what we have to do is take all the possible aggressions that an aggressor can do and sum them up to how we can have bumps on this victim net. Um, it used to be done with what we call an infinite noise window. So um, the, we take the, the all the possible transitions, if this was doing a rising or a falling transition, um, take it into account with the cross cap and sum up all of the different types of uh, aggression that could happen at this victim net. And this was sufficient for older technologies such as pre 90 nanometer or so. But what happened is, is that since um, wires got closer and closer to each other, the cross cap um, grew and then it became too extreme. We had these uh, impossible situations that net B was really slowing down in, uh, in max delay and really speeding up in, in uh, min delay. Uh, and we had to go and fix these problems and we couldn't make it. So uh, a, a new type of a uh, timing analysis was uh, brought up and integrated into the tools, which is called propagated noise analysis. In this case, what we do is we take the actual min and max delays that these um, transitions can happen. So remember that there's some sort of a flip-flop over here and some sort of flip-flop over here, and uh, the signals uh, traverse through this timing path. And it's not like when the clock rises over here, we can have the transition happen over here. It has to propagate through this guy and this guy and this guy and this guy. So depending on the different vectors that can happen, there is some sort of a minimum time that that falling transition can happen and some sort of maximum time that it can happen. Um, so that makes some sort of a window here where this transition can occur. Um, similarly, um, the other aggressor can only happen in some sort of a window. And uh, that means that if we want to sum up what the aggression that this guy can do and what the aggression that this guy can do, it can only happen in uh, the area where these guys overlap. So what we're going to do is we're going to see what the timing window of this high to low uh, bump can happen. Uh, what the timing window of this high to low bump can happen. And we're only going to um, have the worst case happen in the areas where they uh, where they overlap. Um, and doing that propagation makes our worst case uh, be more reasonable and not some, some sort of uh, thing that we can't meet. In any case, we have to run this type of analysis and make sure that our uh, cross coupling is not too um, high, that it causes us all kinds of trouble. So how do we deal with crosstalk problems? What are the solutions for it? So prevention of crosstalk is, first of all, to limit the length of parallel nets. So if we have two nets running parallel to each other, we should increase the wire spacing between them. In general, to just increase wire spacing between nets. Shield special nets. So if we have special nets, we can put a shield in the middle, and that will reduce the cross cap between them by a lot. And one thing that we can for sure do, if this is an aggressor and this is a victim, we can upsize the uh, victim net, and that will decrease the effect of a uh, cross coupling on um, this type of a net that comes after it. Um, we can insert buffers is similar to upsizing the victim net because it will mean that the drive of this part of the net is much larger um, on the victim. Okay, so let's just see a few uh, kind of illustrative examples of this. So in this case, we had two nets, one over here and one over here, and there was some cross cap between this guy and this guy, so we just moved it over, even though it cost us extra wiring, and we could have maybe continued it this way, but we moved it over to reduce the cross coupling. Okay, in this, in this case, we had two um, wires that were running uh, parallel to each other, and so there was cross cap between them. And so what we did is we just moved this wire away, and we spread. We did wire spreading. We even um, traded off the placement of this third net and moved it in between them. We can ground uh, nets, so we can add these. Uh, we can add these shields in between certain nets, and uh, they will cause some sort of a shielding between them. We have to connect these to a constant. Um, voltage if it's ground or VDD. Okay, and if we have a bunch of critical nets and they may be hurting each other timing wise because of cross cap, what we can do is we can take some non critical net and reorder it so it's routed in between them and it's a type of a shield between them. Um, 
A another issue with that is what we know of what we call design for manufacturing or DFM. It can also be known as or certain parts of it is design for yield. And both of these are um, recommended rules that we usually say they're not a necessary DRC. In other words, our, um, our design will be manufactured properly without them. But if we want higher yield and to reduce the risk of certain chips being uh, uh, defective and not um, adding to our yield, we should follow them. So these include wire reduction, redundant via insertion, wire straightening, and wire spreading. Um, and so just as a, a couple examples here, and then I'll go through a couple more on the next slide. Um, we may have, and this is due to the iterative um, nature of our routing algorithms that we sometimes do things, then rip them up, fix them, uh, fix DRCs and so forth. We may have some sort of a wire that looks like this. And it may have empty space over here because of different, uh, again, iterations that change things. Well, that was ridiculous because it's not good for RC, but it's also really bad for uh, manufacturing because now we have these jogs which have a much higher rate of defect than just a straight wire. So we should go over that or our tool will go over that and just straighten the wire. Another example is we have a, a transistor that has two contacts that are symmetric to each other, and that's not great. The, there's a higher risk of, uh, of defect there. So what we should actually do is just add a couple more contacts to make it a lot more uh, symmetrical instead of asymmetric. When we talk about via optimization, okay so after we do route we can go and run a via optimization step and this includes incremental routing for the minimization of vias and replacement of single vias with multi-cut vias so vias are these types of holes that we stick inside our design and they're really small and thin and uh, they're not good for many reasons one of them is that they have a large uh, resistance because they're kind of long and thin and they're not made out of the same uh, very uh, low resistant copper that we use. Um, the other thing is that there's a higher chance of having some of defect inside them and, and so forth. So um, what we're going to do for that is two things. First of all, we're going to see if we can minimize vias, if there are places that we can run around and see if we can um, uh, take something like this and just make it like that, not go up a layer and then down a layer, but just stay at the same layer, even if it causes maybe some sort of a small jog that... Uh, uh, that, that, that goes the wrong way on our same layer. That's minimization of vias. And the other one is to insert multi-cut vias, such as in our example over here, we have just a via over here that turns this way and a via over here that turns that way. And what we're going to do is look and see and we can add three vias with no extra DRC violations on each of them. And then if one of them is defective, the other ones are still there. Plus it reduces the total resistance of the, the connection. Okay, so these uh, operations are required for two things. First of all, re re reliability. So um, uh, if a single via fail, fails, it creates an open and, and the circuit's useless. But if we have a redundant via, then that one will, will, um, uh, uh, will work instead. And the other one is electromigration. So vias, again, they're these thin um, type of... Uh, in, uh, there's a thin type of conductor with um, uh, current going through it. That's a good place for electromigration to eventually break the wire. So if we have several of those, we reduce the risk of uh, electromigration hazards through it. The next thing in uh, DFM is wire spreading um, and widening. And wire spreading achieves uh, two kind of basic things. First of all, it's lower capacitance between the wires, which gives us better, better signal integrity. So we can see here there's an area with all these wires that are very close to each other and so forth. And if after um, there's a high density critical area, there's a high probability of a yield killing effect. If some sort of defect comes here, it can short uh, several wires together and so forth. We'll see in a second um, in the next example. Um, and what we can do is spread them and add this extra space here. We reduce the density density, um, it lowers the uh, yield risk, and it may be even improves timing. Uh, it for sure doesn't impact it. But the other thing is that there's a lower susceptibility to shorts are open due to random particle defects. So um, we see here two kind of uh, pictures that show what happens where a random particle was inside our uh, manufacturing 
um, process and it caused all kinds of things and this one obviously hits a bunch of wires and either causes an open to them or shorts them together and this one looks like it shorts several wires together so we can look at uh, what can happen here when we do wire spreading and wire widening so here there's uh, two wires and um, we have certain types of particles that because they're big and the wires are closest to each other um, they will short these wires together um, whereas uh, if, if the particles hit here but if the particles don't hit uh, exactly there in this area in the middle then uh, because we spread the wires this particle will not short to this wire and this particle will not short to this wire so wire spreading uh, reduced uh, the number of defective chips we had um, in this case we have a thin wire um, is the, the one in the middle and if we got this type of a particle that hit right in the inside this area uh, it would have caused an open and uh, um, and gave us a defective chip but if we had a wide wire which is the whole width of this and the particle hit over here over here we would still have a conductive path obviously the resistance would rise but at least our chip would work and if it's non critical then we could still sell our chip so how do we go about routing in in Ovis um, in the Cadence tool? So um, the, the tool that we use is called NanoRoute. And NanoRoute provides concurrent timing driven and SI driven routing. So when we run uh, route design, what we're going to have, it's going to look at both timing and signal integrity issues. Um, it's not the main thing. We're going to run optimization steps after that as well, but still it does take timing and SI into effect. In, in addition, it can perform multi via cut insertion, wire widening, and spacing to improve our DFM. So the commands for running it are we're going to set a DB command for um, all kinds. There are lots of possibilities here, but for example, route design with timing driven true will mean that we apply timing driven routing. This has an effect on runtime, but it will um, hopefully come out with a, a relatively um, uh, sufficient timing uh, analysis will uh, again we'll have to write some uh, run some sort of timing optimization after it to improve it and set the DB route design with SI driven to true will take into account the signal integrity effects and hopefully um, uh, finish our design without too many um, coupling uh, problems and then we'll run our route design command following this what we're gonna do is we're gonna um, go and do all kinds of a uh, um, post uh, uh, DFM types of things. So we're going to turn off our timing driven routing. We're going to say route design detail post route spread wire true. And what that's going to do is going to uh, do wire spreading route design detail use multi cut via effort high so that's going to go over and try to insert uh, multiple vias wherever it can. And we're going to run route design minus wire opt. Okay, then we can go back and set the B route design with timing driven true. So we're going to go back to the timing driven and run a design optimization with minus post route, uh, minus setup, minus hold. And that's going to go and fix timing for both setup and hold um, in an optimization step. Okay, so we saw that the, the, to achieve a, a high percentage multi uh, cut vias, we're going to use this route design concurrent minimize via account effort high. That's going to minimize vias. Route design detail use multi cut via effort high. That's going to put in as many uh, multi cut vias as possible. And then we're going to check our design after route. That, of course, is followed by a route design minus wire. Route. To check your design after routing, there are lots of different commands such as report route, report wires. <laughs> time design, check DRC, and check connectivity, and many more. Um, finally, where there are all kinds of uh, incremental routing. For example, we have some sort of area where we may have manually um, fix the DRC, or we want to go and uh, do something in a specific area. So we use route design with ECO true and run route global detail to rerun that. So um, that's a type of, uh, there are, again, many, many, many options here. Um, in fact, in recent versions of Innovus, we can also use uh, um, uh, route op design, which will do both um, uh, routing and timing optimization, similar to place op design and to CC op design. Um, so these are, but, and there are many different set DBs here that uh, can affect routing. And again, um, very sparingly change the defaults, but uh, use it to if to solve problems and so forth.
Okay, so now we um, reached the end of our lecture, but not before we discussed the Chip Hall of Fame for this lecture. And this time we decided to focus on um, risk processors and risk processors, reduced instruction set computers, are um, a central part of our computing lives today. Um, there's a very, very high rise in the Risk Five uh, uh, Foundation and the, and the Risk Five processor, and uh, um, we should really thank the revolution of these risk processors to the Sun Microsystems Spark, which was a 2017 inductee into the IEEE Chip Hall of Fame, and uh, Spark stands for Scalable Processor Architecture, and um, it was released in 1987. The architecture was the Spark V7 32-bit architecture, and it's the first major commercial risk processor that took uh, Patterson's ideas at Berkeley into a product. So um, since then, we've had different ones that have been products, such as MIPS is a, a well-known one that maybe some of you learned in a, a computer architecture um, course, and ARM, of course, uh, which started as a risk processor, is the most commonly found risk processor today, even though there are some who claim it's a CISC uh, architecture nowadays. Um, so uh, the CEO of, uh, of Sun Microsystems uh, made a big announcement. He said Spark will take Sun from a $500 million a year company to a billion dollar a year company. And that was a pretty um, big boast uh, to say that and uh, pretty co high confidence. And in fact, the first Spark power powered the Sun 4 workstations, which made Sun a $1 billion a year company. And you can see these Spark 1 station pizza box type computers that used to be found in many companies and in uh, a lot of VLSI design places. Um, about uh, 20 years ago or so. So um, in uh, in 2017, Oracle, which had bought Sun, terminated the Spark architecture, um, decided to no longer um, upkeep it, but Fujitsu uh, bought the rights to it, and uh, they actually claim that they're going to be making some products that are using the Spark architecture still nowadays. So that's the end of our lecture, and again, I would really like to thank Rob Rutenbar for teaching me most of what I know about this type of routing stuff, and there are a bunch of other um, things like the ADESA digital design course and uh, some other places that I've uh, looked into.